Hello everyone, welcome to my Resident Evil Code Veronica X No Damage walkthrough, and we are going to be finishing off Rockford Island for Claire Scenario. This section of the game takes up quite a lot of time, and my previous videos were roughly 14 to 15 minutes worth of content, but I just figured why not just get it done. You know, I figured it would be a greater challenge for myself, because there are some pretty challenging encounters coming up. And for this part right here, we have to get past two dogs. You can choose to shoot the dogs, or you can knife them, or do whatever you want with them. I just choose to run past them, and what I do is... If the dogs decide to get up the moment I get down the staircase, I just immediately make a run for it. If they get up earlier than that, I walk, and then I wait for the dog that's directly in front of me to not be looking at me. So that when I do decide to run, he's going to run into a wall, because he has a lot of trouble making very sharp turns. Despite this hour, I still recommend that you get rid of the dogs. The dogs are pretty good at hitting you when you're trying to get to the ladder because the tank control system doesn't really offer a lot of fluidity of movement based on how rigid it is. So trying to get a very sharp angle just to get to that ladder can be pretty tricky when those dogs are active. It's not like it matters if you waste ammo or not, you're going to get so much ammo back anyway. But make sure you pick up the grenade launcher and we're going to be finally using the blue key card here so we can discard it. There are going to be some grenade rounds in this room. And there will also be one of the proofs that we need to gain access to the plane that will allow us to get out of here. And that's pretty much the main objective of this whole entire section. You have to get these three proofs if you want to get out of here. So, just follow the strategies accordingly and you'll be fine. But coming up is going to be one of the trickiest parts of the game, and it's going to be the lab area that has the baby albinoids. So the albinoids are salamanders that have been injected by the T-virus, and they have the ability to project their bioelectric energy field to shock you. And it does very little damage, but of course in the no damage walkthrough, you can't take any damage from these guys. And this enemy type is pretty bullcrap. For some unknown reason, it takes two grenades to kill them. And they're some of the tiniest enemies in the game. Why the heck should a tiny enemy like that take more than two grenades? And not only that, but their hitboxes are pretty atrocious. They have the ability to shock you from at least five inches away. And there are a lot of these albinoids inside of this lab area. And the strategy that I'm going to use against them is I'm just going to try to run past them. I'm going to wait a little bit, and then I'm just going to hug the edges of the area so that I can get past them. And the obstacles that it provides you are so dumb. There's this dead body inside of this lab area that for some reason forms as an obstacle. Yet, throughout this whole entire game, you've been able to go over the dead bodies of enemies you've killed. This is such a dumb obstacle. I could understand if there was a capsule or something in the way, but... A dead body? Like, could you be any more pathetic with your obstacles? Like, come on. But this is it right here. So once you pick up the skeleton picture, this albinoid triggers the lockdown to begin. And this albinoid is important later on because Chris is going to fight this albinoid later on when it mutates into an adult version of itself. But take this nice and slowly, quick turn once you spawn these guys, hug the other edge, and then be very careful right there. You see how that albinoid didn't shock me just then? I was very lucky. If he chose to shock me, I was done for. But regardless of whether I was going to shoot them or not, it would have still guaranteed a RNG-heavy strategy. I mean, I suppose a better strategy would be to use the explosive bolts. Maybe the grenade launcher isn't the best choice to use. And the game does give you acid rounds, but you only fire a single acid round, and that is not enough to allow you to hit multiple enemies. Whereas with the grenade rounds, you fire a cluster of grenades, so it makes it very easy to hit enemies. So trying to align yourself properly so that you can hit an albinoid with the acid rounds is very hard to do. And even if you were going to use a grenade launcher, it would just be pointless because they take two grenades for no reason. If those enemies died in one shot from the grenade launcher, I think that would actually be a better design section. But as it stands, you're going to have to rely on that strategy when it comes to dealing with that room. But I guess this is the perfect time to talk about the grenade launcher right now. So the grenade launcher. The normal grenade rounds are actually the best grenade rounds to use. I haven't really found a lot of utilities for acid rounds, and the only time I ever use acid rounds is when enemies are very close to me when I'm entering a room. Or if I just decide I don't want to waste too much pistol ammo, so I just use the acid rounds instead. And I actually learned something about acid rounds on this game. So I originally assumed that with all of the older Resident Evil games, acid rounds would always be a one that kill on zombies. I mean, this was not the case with Resident Evil 2 Remake. Acid rounds were very underpowered in Resident Evil 2 Remake, because it took like two acid rounds to finish off a zombie. Well, it turns out in Resident Evil Code Veronica X, acid rounds 
are not a guaranteed one-shot on zombies. It can sometimes take two acid rounds to kill a zombie. And I don't know what causes this, but if the acid rounds are very inconsistent in damage, then that makes them not very reliable when it comes to a very useful utility. Oh, I'm gonna have to pause in this particular tangent because we're about to come across this room over here. And this room coming up, the spawn is different every single time you enter this room. There's three zombies, and... If you get it where one of the zombies is very close to you, you need to go to the right and then loop around him. But this time I got very lucky, so just move very, very slowly, and you'll be able to get past these zombies. I don't know why that spawn there is random, and that's definitely one of the rare parts of Code Veronica where the spawns are random. I mean, the only Resident Evil game that has random spawns whenever you enter a room is Resident Evil Zero. But to balance out this random nature to the spawns in Resident Evil Zero, the enemies would always retain the damage that you dealt to them previously. This was not the same case in the other Resident Evil games. In the other Resident Evil games, the enemies would always regain their health every time you re-enter the room, but their spawns were always the same every single time you re-entered the room. I mean, this isn't that big of a deal, because for the most part, in Resident Evil 1, 2, and 3, and all the games before Resident Evil Code Veronica X, you can pretty much run past zombies very effectively, and you never really have to shoot them or knife them. But in Resident Evil Code Veronica X, you definitely want to finish off the zombies, and make sure that they are dead, because then it just feels like it's a waste of ammo if you end up partially finishing off a zombie, and then you re-enter the room and they're just alive with all their health back again. And I say this because of the turbo nature of the zombies. I got screwed several times when I was trying to record this section by turbo zombies. And with the amount of times I was getting screwed by the turbo zombies, I had to make doubly sure that the zombies were dead. And that they would not just go turbo at a very close range. And you're going to be seeing me use the uh, acid rounds in this whole entire area for dealing with several zombies that are relatively close to me. And then once I do get rid of the zombies that are close to me, I'm just going to swap to my pistol and get rid of the other zombies. But that's literally the only reason I would ever consider using the acid rounds. Every other section, I just don't really see a lot of uses for the acid rounds. I mean, maybe acid rounds are really good against very specific enemy types. I know that Carcinogen SDA utilized acid rounds against the adult Albanoid when he was playing as Chris. But you can easily get that section done with just the submachine guns. Because you do get the submachine guns later on as Chris. And c to continue on with the other rounds that the Grey Hunter can obtain. The incendiary rounds are pretty good. I know that they can one-shot Bandersnatches, but you only ever encounter one Bandersnatch as Chris. Maybe I'll use a, an incendiary round against that one Bandersnatch you encounter as Chris, and then maybe utilize the incendiary rounds against other enemy types. And then the final round you can obtain for the Grenade Launcher that's only exclusive to Resident Evil Code Veronica X, and also to Resident Evil Code Veronica, is the BOW Gas Grenades, and I have not been able to find these gas grenades, nor have I ever looked up a guide on how to obtain them, because I don't really see a lot of uses for them, though, honestly, I mean, they are very powerful grenades, but I don't know if I'll really use them in this walkthrough. Oh, by the way, this is a boss fight. It's a really dumb boss fight, because the boss for this section is that zombie who's looking at me right now, and he is a full-on turbo zombie, he will always be turbo, and for some reason, he works very differently to the standard zombie, he doesn't get flinched when you knife him in the legs at the right moment. And he also has more health than the standard zombie, so the pistol just isn't going to cut it. So the best way to deal with that guy is to fire two grenade rounds at him, the grenade rounds will always stun him, and he will die very quickly. And then he drops his eyeball. But the reason why I call that a really dumb boss fight, even though the grenade rounds constantly stun him every single time you hit him, is because there's no reason for that guy to work differently to the standard zombies. He looks no different to the standard zombies, and even though he's turbo all the time, it isn't the proper excuse to give as to why I should consider them to be a very different kind of zombie. I just think they got very lazy with what to put as a boss fight for that particular area. I wish it was just a different enemy type, that way I could actually understand that being a boss fight. But that's not a boss fight, that's just a really dumb fight with a zombie that shouldn't even gain the kind of properties he has. But now that I've cleared out my space, I can pick up the eyeball now, and using this eyeball, I'll be able to gain access to a room directly below us. And there will be some bats, and there will be some zombies. So, when you place this eyeball in, immediately swap to your lighter. I mean, you don't have to immediately swap to it, because the bats are on the other side of the hallway. So you have plenty of time to put on your lighter. Just make sure you don't give the hemostatic medicine to Rodrigo before this part, because if you give the hemostatic medicine to Rodrigo, you will swap out your lighter for a lockpick, 
and you will not be able to get past these bats very effectively without the lighter. And the game does offer you a bit of flexibility with the paths it wants you to go down. You can choose to come to this beginning area first, or you can use the gold key and use it on a door back in the palace area so you can gain access to a key item. But it's just better to do it this way, because the item that you need from this area, which is the piano roll, will allow you to gain access to the blue scarab that's back in the palace area. And since you're already in the palace area at that time, you can just immediately go for the golden key and gain access to the red scarab. So this is definitely the most optimized path for a no damage walkthrough, or if you're just trying to get through the game normally. But go down these stairs, and we're going to gain access to a death trap area that houses the piano roll that we need. And I have no idea why the Ashfords decided to design this death trap the way it is. Because this is not really a death trap. They're giving you the ability to manipulate the gas by turning this crank. Once you turn this crank entirely, the gas just completely disables. If anybody else designed this death trap, they would not offer this kind of ability for the intruder to get out. Although I guess they wanted to take a more sadistic approach to the death trap, because maybe what they're trying to do is fill you with a uh, false sense of security, and then when you place the rusted sword inside of this casket, a zombie busts out, and you can choose to kill the zombie or not. I choose to kill it because this zombie can be a big pain if he decides to go turbo. So maybe this is the real death trap, maybe this zombie is the actual death trap. But even still though, if he was the real death trap, the door would still remain locked. So, based on all of that, it's definitely clear that this death trap presents with so many faults that don't make any sense. You would think an aristocratic family like the Ashfords, who were held in such high regard by Umbrella, would be able to design better death traps than that. I mean, look at Lucas Baker from Resident Evil 7. The guy's not part of any kind of aristocratic family, and he's an amateur inventor. Yet somehow, he was able to design one of the best death traps ever made in the Resident Evil history, where if you try to solve the death trap the way he wants you to, you're gonna die. Unless you cheat. So, you have to cheat in order to get out of the death trap, which makes total sense for a death trap. So clearly, there is no direct correlation between wealth and death trap capabilities, which you would think would be the case, but apparently it isn't in the Resident Evil series. But we have now obtained the piano roll, which will allow us to gain access to the blue scarab. But before I make my way back to the palace, I'm going to go over to Rodrigo, and I'm going to give him the hemostatic medicine so that I can get the lockpick. You won't be needing the lighter anymore from this point onwards. I mean, the only other section where you'll need the lighter is at the beginning of Chris's scenario, because if you can save Rodrigo from the gulp worm, you will be able to obtain the lighter, and Chris can therefore use the lighter to obtain the submachine gun. And the submachine gun is especially helpful for saving up on pistol bullets, especially after you upgrade uh, Claire's handgun, because Claire's handgun has the highest DPS out of any of the other pistols in the game if you can upgrade it. And this is precisely why we need the lockpick. We need the lockpick so that we can gain access to the handgun parts. And the handgun parts are inside the Dura Lumen case that I picked up. And not only that, but we'll be able to use the lockpick to access the other Dura Lumen case that I got in the first part of the walkthrough. And that will allow us to gain access to bow gunpowder. And I cannot stress enough how important it is to obtain that bow gunpowder. Bow gunpowder is so helpful for making the explosive bolts. And explosive bolts are the most powerful weapon in this game. They will absolutely destroy everything, and you need a lot of explosive bolts for the final boss fight if you want to demolish her. But we have finally obtained the lockpick, and I'm going to use the uh, lockpick to obtain the upgraded handgun. There we go. And all you gotta do is just combine the parts with the handgun, and you have now obtained the most powerful pistol in the game. And it actually has an extended mag, it can actually hold uh, 20 bullets, and it's fully automatic. I mean, you still have to tap the button instead of holding it in order for it to actually work. And you can also swap between the modes, you can swap back to single fire. Although I can't imagine why you would want to do that, because this auto-fire mode for the handgun is so beneficial. And it helps in clearing out zombies, it helps in clearing out a lot of the popcorn enemies, such as the mods later on, because the mods in the Antarctic facility are one of the most annoying enemies in the game. But I'll talk about them when I get to that part of the game, which is very, very soon. It's going to be in the next part. And it's just such a damaging tool. But we are now making our way over to the palace area so that we can use the gold key to obtain the red scarab. But before that point, we're going to meet up with Wesker, who is a key character in Resident Evil Code Veronica. And he is the guy who attacked Rockford Island, and he is the guy who wants the T Veronica virus, and he is the guy who absolutely humiliated Chris to such a degree that Chris really had to undergo a lot of intense training to really keep up with Wesker to make sure that he could actually survive a lot of these inescapable situations and a lot of these lucky pass moments. 
Because you will not believe the amount of lucky passes Chris gets in Resident Evil Co. Veronica. I imagine that's just very humiliating. You know, how exactly would Chris be able to keep up with Wesker if he didn't put himself through intense training? If Chris didn't try to become the person he was in Resident Evil 5? You know, that amount of humiliation is bound to force anyone to go through intense training to make sure that they are keeping up with their opponents. You know, can you give any kind of logical reasoning as to why Resident Evil 5 shouldn't exist? There is no reason that Resident Evil 5 shouldn't exist, and there is no reason that Resident Evil 5 Chris shouldn't exist. Like, you know, the amount of people that complain so much about Chris's biceps and just the way he was, and that he's just turned into a stereotypical wrestler. What possibly could make people believe he is a stereotypical wrestler? They're only judging that based on his physical appearance, but trust me, Chris is nothing like that in Resident Evil 5. You just can't trust the judgments of the Resident Evil community these days. They're just not used to characters evolving through the games. They're so used to the character being exactly how it was from the very first game that he was introduced in. And so when they see Chris the way he is in Resident Evil 5, they're just like, Oh, it's only action horror, it's, it's not survival horror anymore. Like, can you believe that there are people like that who exist in this world? Do you have any idea how impossible it would have been for Chris to survive the kind of situations he was put through in Resident Evil 5 if he didn't undergo a lot of intense training? Heck, Chris would have been dead in Chapter 1-1 of Resident Evil 5 if he didn't put himself through intense training. Wesker made this known to Chris. Wesker clearly showed in Code Veronica that Chris was useless. Chris was nothing. Chris was nothing the way he was. He stood absolutely no chance against Wesker in Code Veronica. And people were like, oh, maybe Chris will actually find a way to beat Wesker? No! There is no physical way that Chris would find a way to beat Wesker if he didn't put himself through intense training. There is no way Chris would have been able to survive the enemies. There is no way Chris would have been able to survive the death traps. There is no way that he would have been able to survive anything that Wesker offered if he didn't put himself through intense training. So if you want to blame anyone for potentially making Resident Evil more action horror than survival horror, blame Wesker! If Wesker hadn't injected himself with the virus and humiliated Chris to such a degree that Chris looked at himself as being very useless when compared to Wesker, then Chris would never have tried to push himself and become who he was in Resident Evil 5. But no, people like Chris took steroids in Resident Evil 5. No, Wesker did! Wesker injected himself with the virus to become who he was. He didn't go through the intense physical training that Chris did. He cheated his way to becoming the kind of super B.O.W. that he is. So if you're going to blame a Resident Evil game that caused Resident Evil to become more action-oriented and actually made it stand out from other survival horror series out there, blame Resident Evil Code Veronica. Game critics have literally called it the closest the series has got to emulating a Hollywood action feature. You heard me right, a Hollywood action feature. There are a lot of action-y things in this game. This game gives you a lot of ammo, this game gives you a lot of machine guns, you have a lot of enemies in single rooms, you have a lot of different enemy types that are pretty lethal, and then you have all the action moments happening during the cinematics with Wesker attacking Claire, with Alfred attacking Claire and Steve, with Steve being the kind of badass that he is. You have all these kind of things that make this feel like a very action-y, fixed camera-based game. And these kind of action-y moments are in the older Resident Evil games, so... In all honesty, guys, action horror is literally no different to survival horror. It's just a name that pe people make up just to cling on to the past. That's all it is. There is no difference between action horror and survival horror. So when people are making the kind of complaints that they have about Resident Evil 4, 5, 6, and all these other Resident Evil games that they consider to be action horror, but then not look at the other action elements in the older Resident Evil games, that to me is just bias. And it's only helping in satisfying this illusion of action horror. Every single survival horror game in existence has action in its own specific way. Action is not just simply explosions everywhere or something akin to that of Call of Duty. Action is literally high-octane gameplay that is high-octane in the minds of the person perceiving it. Even games like Outlast, which are mainly just horror simulators since you can't fight back in any sort of way, have action in their own way when you're just speedrunning through the whole entire game, when you're dodging attacks, when you're just, you know, getting scared by all these different things. That is action in its own right. So when people are saying that Resident Evil is back with the release of Resident Evil 2 Remake, I'm just like, 
Resident Evil has always been around. It's just your rigid mindset prevents you from seeing the bigger picture. And because of this rigid mindset, you need to have that picture literally in your face. Like you have no critical thinking skills. And because of that, you can't identify if this Resident Evil game is truly a Resident Evil game. If it deviates ever so slightly from your nostalgic point of view as to what a Resident Evil game should be. The only reason I can possibly think of as to why people would consider Resident Evil 2 Remake to be a return to the Resident Evil that everyone knows and loves is because they consider it to be scary in how it's presented, with it literally being in your face. A game doesn't have to be scary for it to be considered survival horror. I mean, look at Resident Evil Code Veronica. Resident Evil Code Veronica is not a scary Resident Evil game. This is a very action-y Resident Evil game in how it's presented, and the scary elements that it does have just don't feel as impactful. Despite this hour, it still maintains the other aspects of survival horror really well. You have the limited ammo, you have the different weapons, you have the different enemy types, you have the really nice feedback systems, you have the different environments, you have the different tones of atmosphere. Like, this game satisfies those aspects of the survival horror element really well. Even though the action elements are present in this game, so, the main gist of this argument on the action elements of Resident Evil is that there is no argument to be made. Like, as the proportions of each of the individual aspects of Resident Evil increased, so did the action. The bigger games received more action elements to satisfy that proportion to make the games playable in a way that doesn't feel broken. That's why you had such improved mechanics in Resident Evil 4 that leaned heavily on the action aspects because they increased the proportion on the enemies, on the bigger environments, on the lethality of the enemies. Like, that's just logic. So why people are trying to make this argument as to why action horror is such a big problem or why they even consider action horror to be a thing whatsoever is just baffling to me. And that's all nostalgia really serves to do. All nostalgia does is just reinforce this rigid mindset that everyone has and that prevents them from seeing the bigger picture. That's literally what nostalgia is. But that's all I'm gonna say on that. I think I've dwelled enough on this topic. Let me just get back to what's happening in the video. And I'll probably elaborate on this tangent a little bit more in the later videos. Or maybe in some different walkthrough. So we have managed to make our way to the apex of this building. And we have finally obtained the last proof that we need to gain access to the plane. And fun fact, depending on whether or not that was the final proof that you needed. The cutscene that plays will be different. In a very slight way. If that wasn't the final proof that you needed in order to gain access to the plane, the self-destruct sequence will not trigger, but if that was your final proof that you needed, the self-destruct sequence will actually trigger during this cutscene that's about to play. Which is a nice dynamic moment that happens in this game, and there are a lot of dynamic moments like that depending on your actions in Resident Evil Code Veronica. So of course in my case, the self-destruct sequence has been activated. The timer hasn't started yet, the timer only starts when you get to a brand new area of the facility, but that won't be for a while. So now we just gotta make our way back to the safe room. And once we are outside of the safe room, we're gonna be able to reunite with Steve. And don't think that Steve is going to support you in any way. And Steve doesn't even give us the kind courtesy of clearing out any enemies along the way. So it makes you wonder how the heck did Steve run past these guys? And he has a lot of submachine gun ammo at his disposal. Kinda wish the game let you do that where you can just run past certain enemies, and then once you get to that point, Steve would just clear out the rest of the enemies, so that it was a safe journey back. But, I guess I didn't want you to be too reliant upon that. But I really don't see the ill advantage of it, I mean, this is the last time we're going to be in this area, and we won't be coming back, so... Does it really make that much of a difference if Steve decides to kill a bunch of these enemies that we're only going to be seeing one last time? I don't really think so. But... I have all three proofs in my inventory right now, and now we are going to reunite with Steve. Cue awesome music that plays when the self-destruct sequence begins, and this is honestly one of my favorite pieces of music in this game. It really gets your heart pumping. Resident Evil's always been good for that, with providing a really satisfactory theme to coincide with the self-destruct sequence. Well, aside from Resident Evil 1 Remake, because the music on that game is almost non-existent with how soft it is. The self-destruct theme for Resident Evil 1 Remake was so boring in its reimagining of the original version's self-destruct theme. I think the original version's self-destruct theme is way better than the remake's version. So I don't know how they could royally screw up the soundtrack for Resident Evil 1 Remake and introduce some really boring themes for some of the bosses on that game. Like with Yawn, for instance. Yawn in the original version of Resident Evil 1 had some pretty tense music. I mean, it wasn't quite as tense as Resident Evil 3's final boss fight, but... 
it was some pretty good music. I'm not talking about the director's cut version, though. I'm talking about the original version of Resident Evil 1. The director's cut version of Resident Evil 1 has some really awful music, because it was made by a different composer. But Yon's music in the original version of Resident Evil 1 was way better than in the remix version of Resident Evil 1. Resident Evil 1 Remake is really the main Resident Evil game that has the most bad music. And then second to that will probably be Resident Evil 2 Remake. Because... I don't really hear a lot of the good music in Resident Evil 2 Remake, and a lot of it is just so hard to hear that it's almost like you're hearing nothing. And for my walkthrough for Resident Evil 2 Remake, I turned my music off, and I didn't really feel any different at all. I didn't really feel any kind of emotions springing to light with the inclusion of the music. So, that's just the second Resident Evil game that I would consider to have some pretty bad music. Or music that's just very boring to hear, and it doesn't really change the tone of the game that well. Because it's just not noticeable. But we have now obtained the airplane key, and using this airplane key we're going to gain access to the elevator that will allow us to start the countdown for the self-destruct sequence, and gain access to a boss fight. And the boss fight is going to be against the Tyrant. And the Tyrant is one of my favorite boss fights in this game, because it's designed for knife only. And the same goes with the Plane Tyrant as well, only the Plane Tyrant isn't designed for knife only, it's designed for cargo only. But, focusing mainly on this first fight, it is designed for knife only because you can use the knife to dodge his attacks, and if you wait for him to step a certain amount of steps, you will be able to time your knife hit so that you can dodge his first attack, and then just lay into him. And there are two different states you can put the boss into that could potentially affect the strategy. If, after the second knife hit, he flinches, you've got to knife him twice afterwards. You gotta knife him once so that he gets stunned, and you gotta knife him during a stun animation, and then take a step backwards, and then repeatedly knife him. If he doesn't do the flinch after the second knife hit, you've got to knife him until he gets stunned, but don't knife him during the stun animation. And then just take a step backward and knife him. But this is it. One, two, three, four, five, six... 7 and then knife! He's flinched, so I'm going to try to knife him until he's stunned, I'm going to knife him during the stun animation, I'm going to take a step backwards, and I'm just going to knife him. If you don't take a step backwards, he will hit you as he's rising off the ground. Because when he's rising off the ground, he shifts his hitbox and he can hit you when you yourself shift your hitbox with that knife attack. And also, do not immediately aim at him when the fight starts. You gotta wait a second, and then hold down the aim button. Because if you decide to aim the moment the fight starts, it seems to put you in a very awkward position where that is not going to work. So, make sure you do it exactly like how I do it, and you will be fine. And now we are on to the Plane Tyrant. And this is a boss fight that I have found three strategies to do. And each time... It has been better than the last time. So I'm going to be using this strategy that I discovered while I was doing my no damage walkthrough. And I did post this on my YouTube channel. Where I managed to find an alternative strategy 3 for this boss fight. So wait until he moves 3 steps after he pops into frame. And then take a wide angle around him. Get to this corner. Wait for him to take a step forward a little bit. And then move to this corner. When he straightens out and he takes a step forward, move. Be careful not to run into the cargo, that's the biggest problem with this strategy. It's very hard to tell which direction Claire is facing when she is trying to make a run for it. The only other issues involved with doing this particular strategy involve knowing when exactly you're supposed to move and with positioning yourself correctly so that the Tyrant is very close to the walls. And you need to be very close to the walls so that he doesn't hit you with his running attack as you're running past him. And the reason why he can't hit me with his running attack is because of the way his tank control scheme interprets where I am. So because I'm taking such a wide angle around him, he can't p properly calculate how far he is from me. So because of that, he can't do his running attack on me. The only way he can bypass this issue is if I'm close to him, or if I accidentally take a very sharp angle and I end up running towards him. Those are the only things you gotta bear in mind when you're trying to run past him. But I mean it when I say this is the best possible strategy I've ever discovered for this fight. Until I end up discovering another strategy that works better because that just seems to be the case with this boss fight. I mean my first couple of strategies involved me positioning myself so I was aligned with his left hand side. So that when I ran towards him he would do his correct running attack and then I would just loop to the left to avoid it. And then I would just hug the corners, and then I would just repeat when I had to. But those strategies, while they are very good to do, they are very hard to pull off sometimes. 
Whereas with this one, this isn't that hard to pull off, even though I know for sure it's going to be challenging for some people. And a lot of people have really benefited from my alternative strategies for this fight, because this is definitely one of the hardest fights in the game. And I can definitely understand why. I mean, a lot, a lot of people will just try to use explosive bolts on him, and they will also try to use BOW gas grenades on him. I did see a fast kill video against this guy where they were able to fire three gas grenades at him and, and about eight explosive bolts, and they were able to finish him off in about a minute. But ammo is very precious in this game, even though it's very plentiful at the same time. So I wanted to put in a strategy that is going to help out a lot of people when it comes to saving ammo. And you need a lot of ammo if you want to deal with some of the bosses later on. The final boss fight really demands a lot of ammo, as I've already mentioned previously in my other videos. Oh, this is really cool as well. This is something that is almost non-existent in today's day and age. A near-death status for a boss fight. And when this boss is near death, he cannot do his running attack. He's going to try to close the distance towards you to do his close range attacks. But as long as you stay far away from him, he will never ever get the chance to hit you. And there's only one other Resident Evil game that has a near-death status for an enemy type that's not a boss fight. And that is Resident Evil 3. And this was the case with the Hunters. The Hunters in Resident Evil 3 could also be put into a status where they would have to resort to limping in order to catch up to you. They couldn't jump, they couldn't run, they couldn't do anything that gave them a lot of speed. And this game inherited that mechanic which was really cool. But now that we've done Rockford Island as Claire, we have the ability to create a manual save without the use of a typewriter because we have beaten the first half of Code Veronica and when you beat the first half of Code Veronica, the game will give you a manual save that you can use which is really really kind of the developers. So that is the end of this video, stay tuned for the future parts, thank you all for watching, and you take care now.